Hello, and welcome once again to Economics 101 on the Free Market Network. I am your host, George Connolly. Today's program will examine the validity of the argument for limited government in the regulation of business, and that Adam Smith, author of an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations, had dictated the necessity for such laissez-faire policy. Within that examination, we shall also inquire about the notion that the wealth of nations was also a manifesto for unrestrained capitalism. To understand the wealth of nations necessarily requires an understanding of who Adam Smith was, and the times in which it was written. There was of course no such discipline as economics in the late 18th century. Smith was therefore not an economist. Rather, he was a professor of moral philosophy at the University in Glasgow, Scotland. Drawing from his earlier work, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, and employing for his investigation the scientific method proposed by his friend, David Hume, Smith drew from the writings of those who preceded him on the topic of political economy, historical record, and observation. The resultant remarkable contrasts through which he framed his conclusions for the wealth of nations were most persuasive, and his work now remains the very foundation for economic thought. Well into the first century of the Industrial Revolution by the time of its writing, Britain was the premier industrial nation, yet still struggled with the transition from a rural and mercantilist economy. The squalor in which the working poor subsisted was assured by conspiracy between manufacturers, combinations as Smith phrased it, and actively supported by government, which brutally suppressed the efforts of labor to combine in an effort to improve their lot. It was only natural then that Smith undertook writing The Wealth of Nations. While seeming to give passive approval of government backing of an emerging industrial class through laws prohibiting combinations of workers, Smith opposed mercantilism and government intervention in support of it. He was critical of governmental controls of commerce which in any way restricted free trade, primarily the chartering of monopolistic corporations, controls to effect a favorable balance of trade, price controls and certain classes of taxation primarily on the wages of the working poor, and tariffs. On the whole, he advocated few restrictions on government, and in fact credited the English government for the nation's prosperity. Far from some strict notion of laissez-faire advocacy, Smith in fact advocated the role of government within the broader picture of political economy, including defense, justice, restrictions on usury, public works, infrastructure as we know it, and institutions to facilitate commerce, not the least of which was public education to assure ongoing advances in the means of production. In the main, Smith's prescription is summed up in quoting him saying, the uniform, constant, and uninterrupted effort of every man to better his condition, the principle from which public and national, as well as private opulence is originally derived, is frequently powerful enough to maintain the natural progress of things towards improvement, in spite both of the extravagance of government, and of the greatest errors of administration. This statement underlies his optimistic faith that men will eschew self-love, and do the moral thing out of self-interest. To differentiate these concepts, let us first observe that self-love is what we currently call greed. Self-interest is a bit more complex. Since the effort of every man to better his condition underlay the wealth of the nation, it forms the basis for moral obligation of men to pursue their self-interest. Smith was not so much prescriptive in outlining how best to serve self-interest, and most often simply described how it had been served, or more exactly how it had been badly served. In example, he somewhat counterintuitively said, it is the great multiplication of the productions of all the different arts, in consequence of the division of labor, which occasions, in a well-governed society, that universal opulence which extends itself to the lowest ranks of the people. The liberal reward of labor, therefore, as it is the necessary effect, so it is the natural symptom of increasing national wealth. The scanty maintenance of the laboring poor, on the other hand, is the natural symptom that things are at a stand, and their starving condition, that they are going fast backwards.
and continued with the example that the province of Holland, on the other hand, in proportion to the extent of its territory and the number of its people, is a richer country than England. The wages of labor are said to be higher in Holland than in England, and the Dutch, it is well known, trade upon lower profits than any people in Europe. Indeed, far from being a demagogue for the capitalists of his time, he explicitly equated labor with commerce, as we see in the statement referring to labor, he supplies the far greater part of his labor and talents by exchanging that surplus part of the produce of his own labor, which is over and above his own consumption, for such parts of the produce of other men's labor as he has occasion for. Every man thus lives by exchanging, or becomes, in some measure, a merchant, and the society itself grows to be what is properly a commercial society. As mentioned earlier, Smith decried the favoritism granted to what were termed corporations. While the reference included guilds which limited the number of apprentices a master craftsman could employ, it most strenuously referred to joint stock companies created by the king as royal charter trading companies, which exerted a quasi-governmental authority in restraint of free trade, and most egregiously in Smith's view were those restrictions on labor's ability to enjoy the benefit of free trade in its skills. To move about from labor market to market to seek more favorable employment. The extent to which advocates of unrestrained capitalism, a reprehensible cabal of demagogues, have taken Smith's work out of context, for its rhetorical effect in validating their spurious argument, is appalling, and the more appalling for its consequence. Capitalism when unrestrained even for self-interest, and subject too often to wild speculation in markets, falls into self-love, greed, thus serving not the greater wealth of the nation, but the wealth of the few, disaster befalls all. In these centuries since Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, this concept of self-interest has become conflated with that concept of self-love largely through ignorance. There can be little doubt that those who advocate unrestrained capitalism either never read the wealth of nations, or failed to understand it if they had. It is after all a tedious read. It may be as well, that it was perverted by those whose callous disdain for the general good, who seek only their personal aggrandizement at any cost, have led otherwise sensible men astray. What is not clear in the conventional understanding is, that, while he advocated abstention from measures by government to regulate the conduct of business to assure the benefits of a free market for all, he also advocated markets free from corporate governance which employed measures anathematic to the wealth of nations. It is however certain that Smith placed too much stock in the better nature of men, and that greed and speculation, like the tulip bubble, through the housing bubble and subprime lending fiasco, which led to the current worldwide economic collapse, will require, not a deluded Tea Party advocacy of policy which brought on the economic collapse, but an expansion of movements such as Occupy Wall Street. Thank you for once again joining me on Economics 101. I hope you have found this program enlightening, and will tune in again for our next broadcast. Good night, and good fortune.